Coming up on DTNS, Blizzard suspends a player for his political statement. The U.S. restricts trade with eight tech companies. And in happier news, PlayStation 5. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 8th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Getting Colder and Darker Finland, I'm Patrick Bejo. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Despite the cold and the dark, uh, Patrick uh, was giving us a, the scoop on his new Oculus Quest, and we, we were talking about the future of VR on Good Day Internet. Uh, so if you want that wider conversation, it goes all over the place. You never know where it's going to go. Uh, you got to get it by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Tile announced a new device tracker called Sticker that includes waterproofing and 3M adhesive to attach to most metal and plastic objects. Tile Sticker is available in twin packs for $39.99 or a pack of four for $59.99. Also, a new Tile Slim has a louder speaker and 200 foot range for $30, and the range for the Tile Mate and Tile Pro tags have increased to 400 feet. Samsung is forecasting a drop in profits, but it is also not as bad as expected thanks to strong Galaxy Note 10 sales. Sagging memory chip prices have hurt Samsung's profit, but there are signs that the global memory chip business will stabilize next year as data center orders pick up, though US-China trade issues will affect that sector. Opera released the Opera 64 browser, which includes a tracker blocker and reportedly delivers roughly 20% faster page load times. Uh, Opera's blocker uses the Easy Privacy Tracking Protection List, which covers a library of known tracker scripts, but does not auto-determine which trackers are problematic. Other features of Opera 64 include an upgraded snapshot that lets you save sites as PDFs, capture screenshots, and annotation features like emojis, selfies, and text. All right, let's talk a little bit about Google changing its requirements. Indeed, XDA developers report that uh, Android partners must, must load digital well-being and family link or equivalent services as part of the Google mobile services requirements. The digital well-being app includes screen time statistics, app opens and notification tracking. It also has an app timer and the wind down feature that slowly turns the screen grayscale as it gets late. There's also a focus mode and do not disturb mode. Mode. Family Link includes parental controls. If a headset handset maker wants to in include its own solution, it must be placed at top level settings, have an onboarding screen, and include the same basic features as well being and Family Link. The new Google Mobile Services requirements also require full interoperability with standard USB C chargers, including the USB PD fast charging standard. That means you wouldn't need a power break from your phone maker in order to get fast charging uh you know i mean first of all uh making it so that you don't have to make sure that you carry around uh you, you could use whatever charger you want if it's standard uh, for fast charging is pretty cool i like that um i'm sure that the device makers probably want to push back against that but uh, that, that's a good one i really like uh making digital well-being app part of the google mobile services say look uh if you're going to include Google search and Google maps and all of that. You have to include some screen time management and parental control features as an option. We have one, you can use ours, or if yours has the same features, you can use yours. Uh, and theoretically they could just find a third party one that matches the same features and install that one. But just saying like that needs to be available uh, for users of any Android phone. Uh, I, I like it. I think it's a good idea. Well, and before the show, I was like, well, these are great features. Good on Android. And Tom, you were like, well, I mean, they, they're, they've already been here, but this is more of just a mandatory type thing. So I guess the pessimist in me is sort of like, is this something on Google's side of possible liability where you've mm -hmm. got to give people this option and if for some reason you don't then it may come back that you know the the, the you know the cell phone was 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 in fact the reason that you know somebody went sideways i don't really know that's probably um an overly pessimistic view of this but i wonder why this has you know become a mandate 
Yeah, it seems like a branding effort to me. Not branding, but making sure that Android phones care about your uh, well-being as much as you know Google does, um, so that you can't point to Android and say, "Well, those phones don't give you that kind of information that you would need to know to understand your usage of the phone." Um, I'm also wondering if this is the only one of those services that. Uh, uh, that manufacturers can opt out of if they provide the equivalent themselves. Um, it seems like an interesting choice for Google to say, maybe it has to do with um, monopoly issues. They say, okay, you need to have something. It can be yours. It can be ours. We will provide it to you. But I don't think there's any other service on the Android ecosystem that Google says, you have to have it, but it doesn't have to be ours. I, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say uh, companies can do something for purely selfish reasons that still ends up being good for us. And I think this is definitely yeah, an example because I yeah, look at this and Sarah, true. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, they said, oh, crap, Apple's going to market screen time and parental controls against Android phones out there. Let's just make it a standard. Oh, crap. If we make it a standard, uh, we're going to run into antitrust issues again. Right. So let's make it <laughs> flexible. Uh, OK, great. Uh, it's the standard standard approved that that feels like a likely explanation uh, for how this comes down. You know, but all kidding aside, well, we're not really kidding, but a lot of these features are really good, whether or not you use them. As, as somebody who's, you know, got a phone in front of you all the time, it's kind of on you. But they are they 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 are potentially really helpful for a lot yeah, of folks. And you, don't, so. and you don't have to use them. Right, they're, they're exactly. They're just options for you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just good to, you know, at, at least be forced to have the option. <laughs> Blizzard suspended a Hong Kong-based professional Hearthstone player, uh, Blitz Chung, uh, Chung Ng. Uh, he was a uh, Hearthstone Grandmaster. He is no longer. In a post-game interview on a Taiwanese broadcast on October 6th, Chung wore a mask and goggles. Uh, Hong Kong recently banned the wearing of masks in protest in Hong Kong, so that itself was somewhat uh, a political statement. And then Chung uh, said one of the slogans of Hong Kong protesters. The broadcast cut away immediately, and the video of the interview has been taken offline. Uh, but Blizzard said that Chung's statement violated tournament rules against doing something that, quote, brings you into public disrepute, offends a portion or group of the public, or otherwise damages Blizzard's image. Chung has not only been removed from the Grandmasters program, but also had about $10,000 worth of earnings revoked and has been banned from participating in Hearthstone esports for a year. Uh, Blizzard, in a statement, said, while we stand by one's right to express individual thoughts and opinions, players and other participants that elect to participate in our esports competitions must abide by the official competition rules. Mm -hmm. Now, this is... This, <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, first... I used to work for Blizzard. I have a deep affection for that company and their games. I've been playing them for a long time. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, it is a really difficult situation when they're saying, while we stand by one right to express individual thoughts and opinions, but they must abide by the com competition rules. If those competition rules essentially mean that you can't express your opinions, there's kind of a problem in the, 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 the statement to begin with. Um, that being said, it is obviously a difficult political situation that governments tiptoe around and don't really call out China on. Um, should it should Blizzard should it be Blizzard's role to defy the Chinese government, especially since they have a lot of business in China that whose licenses could be revoked within a day? Um, I don't know. I don't like that it's happening, but there are. It's not a simple question, I think. Well, it's not. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for Blizzard, uh, in explaining this, they have a, a, a very clear and similar situation happening with the United States NBA. Uh, one of the uh, NBA coaches uh, tweeted something in support of the Hong Kong protests. Uh, and the NBA commissioner said uh, at first the NBA sort of uh, said, well, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't great. We apologize for it. Uh, but then stood by 
uh, the right of that person to say what they said on Twitter to the point that now NBA broadcasts have been canceled in China, NBA games that were going to take place in, have been canceled in China, and like appearances by NBA players at schools have been canceled. So the NBA decided to go a different way and say, yeah, this is going to hurt us. We're going to lose money. We're going to have things canceled, uh, but we're going to stand by uh, a person's right to say something. Blizzard made a different decision here. Uh, I, I wonder there, how much of the NBA's revenue is, you know, what percentage of NBA's it is revenue a, is I will, I will guarantee it's, it's you without quite, looking, it's lower than the NBA's percentage of revenue from China, for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, Blizzard makes a lot of money out of China. Exactly. So it, it's not an equivalent decision. You're right. Um, but, I, I, you know, Blizzard's saying that this was violated tournament rules in Taiwan. Uh, which, you know, already we've got uh, a, a situation rife with problems because it brought the person into public disrepute. Well, in China it did. Outside of China it didn't. Offended a portion or group of the public? Well, it offended the Chinese government, certainly. Is that is yeah. that who you're... I mean, that's the tricky part of this is I wonder if someone made a political statement about uh, a candidate in an election, say, or, or about Brexit, would they have banned someone for that? I mean, they, these are thought experiments. We don't know, but no, I, it, I mean, it's tricky. I, yeah, it's it's an interesting thought experiment that you mentioned these things. But the the core of the matter is China is not the UK, is not uh, the US, is not France. It is a very restrictive, you know, regime, and that's the problem. Um, now, Blizzard could choose to stand up to them, and maybe they should. I don't know. But it, you can't compare it to situations, you know, in, in the U.S. or the U.K. because the government is not the well, same. Well, you can, but it is, it is a, I mean, what people will say is this is why you shouldn't be doing business in China because then you're going sure. to have to do things like this. Yes, uh, there's so, an I mean, argument that's, to be That's where the comparison is. Yeah, I think a lot of this, if I compare, if I think of an esports player to a uh, a, a physical sports player, right? They're not, you know, it's apples and oranges somewhat, but but more and more the lines are blurred. Um, to have uh, $10,000 taken away from you and to have certain rights revoked, there are lots of things that a sports player of, you know, in many certain disciplines can do for that to happen. This is not one of them that at least I'm familiar with. So I wonder how much more of this will be seen based on, you know, what companies own these sorts of franchises. On a pizza note, <laughs> it's actually less about pizza and more about accessibility. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear an appeal from Domino's, yes, the pizza maker, over web and mobile accessibility requirements. That means the ruling by a panel of the Ninth uh, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is going to stand. The panel ruled that the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act does apply to online platforms. Guillermo Robles sued Domino's after being unable to order food from the restaurant's website or mobile app using screen reading software. Robles is now clear to bring his case against Domino's to trial. Yes, yeah, so this is a follow up for us. I remember we we did talk about this when when the uh, the the lawsuit was proceeding through the lower courts, and we knew it was probably going to end up at the Supreme Court. So, uh, what this does is say you are subject to the ADA Act, Domino's. You can't just get out of the entire lawsuit by saying, yeah, ADA only applies to physical locations. This is this is a website. Uh, so it doesn't mean that Domino's has lost the case. They could still pretend, potentially win at trial to say, but our website didn't violate the ADA. They were trying to get out of having the ADA applied at all, and that's not going to work. And, and essentially that means the ADA applies to websites in general, I yes. suppose. Pose with it jurisprudence. That's that right? precedent, correct? And and it should. Yeah, it seems like. I a mean, pretty, yes um, and no. I mean, yes. I mean, when, when is it? In, when is it? In, no. Well, in spirit, yes, it should. But also, a law written in 1990 with no contemplation of the website is probably not suitable Outdated, to the task yeah. for good or ill. Right? It probably doesn't protect things it should protect because it wasn't written for that. Um, that said, uh, I, I I think that they reasonably said, well, there isn't another law, so this is the law you've got. Uh, I I think you probably need a new law to to apply more specifically to how websites should be accessible but this is this is what you got for now all right back to china sorry the us placed eight <laughs> chinese tech companies on on its entity list which restricts us companies from trading with them that's the same list huawei got put on so without a license 
uh, you are not allowed as a U.S. company to sell any of your products to these eight companies. The companies include Hikvision. A lot of you might have some cameras from Hikvision in your house. Uh, they are more of a enterprise surveillance and camera company. Uh, Dahua is another one. Uh, between the two of them, they make up about a third of the video surveillance camera market in the world. Facial recognition company SenseTime. Uh, their technology is used in your Oppo and your Vivo phones, if you have those. Uh, the world's most valuable AI startup is SenseTime, so it hits another one really hard. Uh, Face++ Plus Plus maker Megvi, a uh, facial recognition company, uh, preparing for a Hong Kong IPO. That that hits them at an, a, a very inconvenient time. Voice recognition software maker iFly Tech, data recovery company Maya Pico, micro and nano fab equipment maker Yixin Science, and technology and facial recognition company Yitu. Uh, the U.S. accuses these eight restricted companies of facilitating human rights violations against, quote, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other members of Muslim minority groups in China. Uh, there are also restrictions slapped against government institutions uh, of China as well, uh, many more of those. But this is about the uh, accusations of oppression in the western part of China against these groups. Uh, China's Vice Premier Liu He arrives in the U.S. Thursday for trade talks, and the U.S. Commerce Department did say that the addition of these eight companies to the entity list was unrelated to the talks. That's what they said. Um, yeah, it's another one of those. I mean, obviously we're back on China and what's happening, um, to the Uyghur especially is pretty horrendous. Um, is that, uh, kind of being leveraged by the U S government to put pressure on the Chinese government? Maybe, uh, doesn't make it less, uh, objectionable. <sighs> yeah. Uh, I, here, here's what I'll say. I, I have been one to to very carefully look at the evidence for Huawei. And I am suspicious that the Huawei restriction has as much to do with real security concerns as it does with leverage. Uh, or maybe there's something else going on be behind the scenes. But I don't think Huawei's security vulnerabilities are as obvious as some of my very close friends believe, right? I'm not saying they're impossible, but I feel like that is an accusation built on a lot of assumption uh, whereas these are companies that were, in fact, undisputably providing technology that was used in these vocational centers, as China calls them, uh, in the west of China. And so if the U.S., as it does, believes that this is a human rights violation, then punishing these eight companies makes perfect sense. Uh, whether, you know, the timing is because of the trade restrictions, come on, you can't tell me it's not. Give me a break. But I kind of feel like they would have put these restrictions in in any case, to be honest. I don't know that, I mean, I'm sure there are many, many different companies and tech companies and other types of companies that have some relationship with the U.S. that also aid the Chinese government in those uh, camps. Uh, I mean, maybe this possi is a possibly. Uh, I, I haven't. Uh, you're, you're right. I haven't looked in it to find out if these eight are really the eight. Uh, but this this definitely feels to me l like a very plausible situation of the majority of the equipment provided here was from these eight companies. Uh, and let's, you know, l let's target them. And by the way, the fact that they're also, a, you know, a nice collection of AI companies in there, that doesn't hurt. But it's not eight AI companies. So it, it feels more yeah. plausible to me that this is this is really the majority of providers of the tech. Because honestly, if I was going to create the kind of surveillance tech they're talking about, I'd probably use these eight companies. They're they're strong companies, strong contenders. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I, I I guess my final point is that the 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 ultimate responsibility for all of this is the chinese government mm. and maybe going after it directly is more difficult so this is a good way of doing it but the ultimate goal would be that still. well they are all as i mentioned they're also going directly after chinese institutions uh as well like government institutions directly and restricting their ability to buy this stuff too yeah. so it's all part and parcel uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, the heavy news is now done. Sony's president <laughs> of Sony Interactive Entertainment, Jim Ryan, announced in a blog post that the next PlayStation console will be called, as you probably thought, the PlayStation 5, and will be available in time for the 2020 holiday season. Patrick, there, there was a bunch of other uh, revelations along with that. Tell us about it. 
Yeah, there's some interesting stuff. Um, a lot we already knew or suspected. For example, as you mentioned, the name is going to be PlayStation 5. Um, the ray tracing, which they said uh, the PlayStation 5 would be capable of, will indeed be hardware-based. There were questions about that. Um, it will include a UHD, UHD Blu-ray uh, drive. So if you're hesitating on buying a, a blu-ray drive maybe wait for the playstation because you can get both uh, a game console and the drive the other technical uh, tidbits that i thought were interesting they talked about the ssd and what it can do of course until now all consoles um modern consoles have had hard drives um this is going to have an ssd and not only does it help with boot time loading time uh, streaming they seem to be pushing into streaming quite a bit um it also saves a uh, disk space because what developers are doing which i didn't realize uh with current uh uh, hard drive technologies is copying the data at multiple spots of the disk image so that uh, the the head doesn't have to travel too much to load the data. The, the data loading is a big issue for developers. Um, so that's going to make smaller sized uh, installs, which is good. They're also going to facilitate modular installs for games. So if you have a multiplayer and a single player components, you could choose which one you install. If you're done with the single player and want to keep the multiplayer, player you can remove that one so that's going to be interesting um, they're going to improve the data sharing across the network so that you will be able to know what sp specific activity in game your friends are into and maybe join them more easily something that we've seen in other um, gaming systems on the pc especially but it's nice to see it's going to be arriving on uh, the playstation 5 and maybe the most interesting uh, evolution is the controller, as is often the case with new generations of consoles. Uh, it's going to have adaptive triggers with haptic feedback that, according to the Wired journalist, are very convincing. Uh, they manage to convey the feeling, the different feelings you have maybe in a car if you're, dr you're driving on a road or in uh, dirt or stuff like that. It works pretty well. Um, it's going to have uh, better speed and a USB Type-C, which, as you mentioned on yesterday's show, everyone now loves. So um, that's a, a good chunk of different, not, not revolutionary changes, but interesting evolutions. Yeah, tasty tidbits here. Uh, Theater Monkey was pointing out in the chat that a lot of people have swapped out uh, their solid-state drives themselves, which will improve your speed, but... The I don't know that the games know that you have a solid state drive since they aren't expecting one. So I don't know that they don't still do the multiple saves. So you're going to see a, not only faster load times, but but smaller installations because they don't have to plan for that magnetic drive. I feel like that's probably the most impressive part of this is, is hey, just, uh, yeah, it makes me go like, why didn't you do a solid state drive before? Well, I know why <laughs> it was expensive, right? But uh, it's it's great that they can finally take advantage of that. And, and I hadn't thought about that idea of saving space because you don't have to try to tweak your load times by duplicating data. Uh, that's amazing. They're, and with the modular installs, they were talking in that Wired article about uh, and we'll see if this really ends up being this case, but they're like, this is like having a cart. You used to put your cart into an old console and it would load instantly. We're getting, we're getting back to that. I doubt it's going to be quite that fast, but it's nice to hear them saying we're going to be close anyway. And the, the SSD generation, uh, technology generation is, is more advanced than the ones mm. we have now. So that is also playing into this, the speed, which is significantly higher than what we have, even with an SSD today. Um, the, the timing of the announcement is interesting. It's a little bit out of nowhere. And Sony has been known to do things like that for PlayStation without big, big events to announce, uh, some things, um, I, I guess it could be seen as a way to keep Sony and the PlayStation in the conversation as Microsoft and uh, Google are readying tests or even launches for their streaming services. Um, so that keeps them in the conversation, as I said. Um, I also wonder if this isn't the uh, uh, because the developers are getting more developers are getting dev kits and the controller which had been a closely guarded a secret until now so they're 
messaging things the way they want to to make sure things don't leak and um, you know get reported here and there. Um, and maybe this is the least interesting info they have to give us. So they're <laughs> getting it out of the way now and their big announcements will have more interesting and different things. The mind boggles, yeah. Because the, the controller seems to be getting the most attention in, in headlines and stuff because of the idea of, you know, it's not just a rumble pack anymore and that that sort of adaptive trigger sounds really interesting, you know, and making it feel more realistic when you're shooting a bow and arrow versus pressing a trigger on different kinds of guns, all that sort of stuff. But you're right. I think they are doing both. Uh, I th in fact, I'm convinced now that Microsoft announced their dual screen devices uh, more than a year in advance because of developer interest. They want to drum up developer interest. And that makes sense to me that they're like, hey, we're going to be shipping out these controllers to devs. Uh, let's avoid some leaks and also drum up some more interest and excitement by talking about them now. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and I, I'll add that they did indicate that they'll have more to say over the coming months, which means we're going to get more of these little announcements from Sony. They're going to try, as you said, to keep the PlayStation 5 in the conversation by doling out interesting tidbits, you know, a little bit at a time, rather than having it all leaked and then trying to have a big announcement when everybody's like, yeah, but that's what all the leaks said. I think that mm -hmm. might be smart. Yeah, it's a pretty good move. Well, also full of interesting tidbits is our subreddit community. Thanks to everybody who participates. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We also have a Facebook group, which is very lively. Join it. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's do it. Josh wrote in about our story that we were kicking around yesterday mm -hmm. about California's 60-day rule on deep fake videos on social media before an election and the fact that 60 days is a bit of a cutoff point but, uh, before the rules get a little bit more stringent. Josh says, this seems consistent with what I've always heard with FEC rules for advertisements, yard signs, and the like. That 68 rule pops up in a lot of election ad staff. What's more curious is why the other law, based on your coverage, doesn't make to, doesn't seem to make distribution illegal, just creation. That creates a lot of plausible deniability because who really knows where something they blindly share really came from? Yeah, I, I no, you're right about the distribution. Uh, they don't want to get into a safe harbor situation where Facebook says, well, wait, we're technically distributing it, but we didn't know it was there and, and we're safe harbor. And if you tell us to take all that stuff, I think that's why that's not there. You're totally right about the 60 day. Now, I still think you just make it illegal to do this kind of stuff, to post this kind of stuff. But uh, if you're going to have a limit, the 60 day rule absolutely must be because that's just the standard for election yeah. rules in yeah, all kinds I of was, situations. I was screaming at my car uh, listening to the show yesterday or this morning. Um, I was surprised that you weren't aware of the 60 days. You know, it's two, three months usually. <sighs> you were surprised. And that I wasn't aware of something you knew. I know. I'm, I should know everything, but <laughs> no, I don't. But I mean, it's, no, I mean, it, it seems like, to me, it seems like such an obvious thing. And maybe it's because the overbearing French government does things like that all the time. But ah, okay. protecting the, 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 the speech and discourse around election time is something that is uh, pretty obvious. We have a ban on uh, political ads and stuff like that. You yeah, know, yeah. That, that are so... That seemed like I, I, I completely understand the sixty days window. I guess. Yeah, I I think I'm just like well, if it's deceptive in the first place, then it, yeah, right. Crack down on it year round, but yeah. no, but yeah. you you mentioned that in the show as well. Then it becomes too restrictive for freedom mm -hmm. of speech because yeah, you can't do humor, you can't you know so. So elections um, are a special time and special yeah, rules. yeah. I'm curious if a parody, if there would be a parody exemption within the sixty days, because it's intent to deceive, and a parody wouldn't have the intent to deceive. Anyway, we could go on. Instead, let's give a shout out to Degracia Daniels, John Johnston, and Chris Smith uh, for supporting us at the master and grandmaster levels. Thank you all and everyone who supports us on Patreon.com. Thank you, everybody. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja for being with us today. Patrick, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Uh, I would say if you enjoy the discussion about PlayStation and other gaming topics, go check out Pixels. Uh, our show MVGB sadly is going away. You can listen to the latest episode in the feed. It's up now. But if you want to continue the uh, lovely gaming podcasting experience, Pixels is on your podcast app and it's a pretty fun show. 
Yeah, go check out Pixels, folks. It's a it's a it's a great show, uh, and it and it's it's a good way to to keep up with people that you trust on what's going on in the video game world. <laughs> Uh, we have new Patreon rewards. Becoming a member of DTNS gets you a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. Uh, I, I was I just turned on uh, the mic in the backstage room in Discord this morning while I was working on something. Nobody showed up yet, but you could have been in there and heard me if you were at the right level. And everybody who's at the $2 level or above as of November 1st gets a PDF copy of our cookbook. Uh, you get recipes from Justin Robert Young, Patrick Beja, Allison Sheridan, Sarah Lane, myself, Roger Chang, and some listeners as well. Sign up right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. And boy, is there some variety in those recipes. Yes, there is. <laughs> I'm on the side of I'm hungry. I need to eat in four seconds. What's best? Uh, but that's part of it, um, as well as everybody else. So thanks, everybody, for participating. Also, thanks to you for participating by giving us feedback. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us email early and often. We are also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 20.30 to see. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>